All right, I hear we're good to start. Um, hello, everyone. Thanks for lending us your time and joining us uh, on this talk on zonal outage operational stories. Uh, my name is Shyam Jirigunta, and I'm joined by Jyoti Mahapatra. Both of us uh, are software engineers from uh, Amazon EKS at AWS and come from a team that ensures reliability of clusters during zonal outages of, or partial failures of various kinds. Uh, together, our team has successfully mitigated dozens of such events, learned some valuable lessons along the way, um, and used those to engineer highly available and reliable Kubernetes clusters. And that's exactly what we're going to talk today. Our focus will be on the Kubernetes control plane, uh, but some of the learnings also apply more broadly to um, user applications or, or components within the data plane of the Kubernetes cluster. Um, so I'd like to start with uh, this model. It's called a Swiss cheese model. Um, I wish I could say French cheese, but I guess Swiss cheese just has more holes uh, in it. So um, this is a model that's used to analyze and manage risks in large complex systems with many moving parts. Um, it's an effective mental model that's been used time and again in various industries like aviation, healthcare, nuclear power plants, and even distributed software systems. Essentially, each hole in the cheese represents a weakness or a dormant failure uh, that could manifest itself in the presence of an external trigger or a hazard. Uh, for example, it could be a bug in the flight's uh, menu RSS system that gets triggered at a specific airspeed or altitude. Um, if you're familiar with the whole Concord fiasco, you probably know what I'm talking about. Uh, there we go, a French reference. <laughs> um, OK, so diving a little deeper, as software engineers, we often see ourselves striving to build systems or services uh, that operate reliably always. But the reality is distributed systems are practically impossible to be made flawless. Um, your block of cheese will have holes in it. And in the fullness of time and scale, uh, there will be different kinds of failures that will happen in individual components, um, microservices, and even their interactions. Uh, for instance, hardware that your Kubernetes cluster runs on will eventually fail. And this uh, includes compute, uh, your CPUs, GPUs, and even um, volumes and disk storage, right? Even the best health checks, sometimes they don't detect certain failures. Um, nodes sometimes get partitioned over network um, uh, in weird ways. Sometimes it's uh, partitioned bidirectionally, sometimes only in one direction. So the best bet is actually to try as much as possible to decouple these failure modes, uh, make them uncorrelated, and thereby reducing the overall single points of failures that your system um, has. Uh, the idea is that by by reducing such uh, single points of failures, you're increasing the number of things that need to go down in your system before it, it, it breaks down, uh, which basically steeply, even exponentially reduces the, the probability of that happening. And that's exactly what this Swiss cheese model view is showing here. Um, there are a few ways to interpret it. The most common one is each slice of the cheese uh, can be thought of as different components or layers uh, within your, uh, or layers of defenses in your system that uh, have been built to protect it from, let's say, downtime. And each layer, of course, has some sort of holes in it at different places and of different magnitudes. And the red lines that go through these are hazards which uh, the system is facing. And the one red line that actually made it all the way till the end that was able to successfully wreak havoc because it had something good going on for it. That is, uh, all the holes in its path have lined up and making it a single point of failure for the system. So avoiding these sort of uh, failures needs deeper thought and rigorous engineering. Uh, we're going to talk about that a little bit going forward. But first, I also want to present another, sorry. Uh, yeah, another concept of redundancy. So this is a foundational mechanism that uh, a lot of distributed systems leverage to achieve high availability. Um, 
redundancy is it's essentially the concept of running multiple replicas of your software and hardware so that if one or more replicas fail, the others can continue to keep the lights on. Similarly, in databases land, high durability is achieved by uh, maintaining redundant copies of the data across multiple hosts. Um, redundancy helps reduce the probability of the system uh, failing, but in the face of uncorrelated independent failures, not correlated failures. So let's say there's a bug in uh, the component that you've replicated in a way that, let's say, a bad write to a database has crashed all three replicas, then it is a correlated failure. And redundancy in that case doesn't help, actually. Um, so to avoid these sort of all for one, one for all situation, uh, let's talk more about how can we uncorrelate these failures. Um, and I want to introduce at this point uh, the concept of a failure domain. So uh, if you're familiar, commercial data centers lay out the hardware and the, and the connecting network infrastructure over a specific topology. And this topology is typically hierarchical. And a simple version of that is what's shown here. It's basically a tree uh, where servers and uh, uh, the other hardware, like uh, disks, are arranged into rows or racks, and which kind of roll up into maybe rooms, and that rolls up into your entire data, uh, data center. And each rack is typically connected with uh, L2 switches. Uh, it's commonly called leaf-level switches. And they, in turn, are connected to uh, larger groups of servers through L2 or L3 spine-level uh, switches. And as you can imagine, there are failure points at each level. For instance, a single server in a given rack uh, could become inoperable due to a hardware malfunction. Or a broken Ethernet cable or the switch could take down the whole rack. right? Um, and similarly, a power loss could take down a whole room of servers. So there are layers of failure domains here. Um, then which one do we actually use for redundancy? Um, as it turns out, the most common practice, uh, especially with uh, some of the larger cloud providers or data centers, is, is to use uh, a single data center as the unit of redundancy. It's essentially a physical building or a bunch of co-located buildings uh, housing the hardware and other supporting in, uh, infrastructure like power supply, cooling systems, uh, disaster recovery mechanisms. And this, it's typically called a zone or an availability zone. Um, now, a region is essentially a collection, a geographical area uh, a, a cloud provider may operate in, uh, which is a collection of multiple of these uh, data centers or zones. Uh, they're often placed in close proximity to allow for low latency uh, communication between, between those AZs, typically connected physically. Um, uh, through massive backbone uh, cables. And uh, while they're kept close enough uh, in terms of proximity, they um, they also need to be kept far enough so that the chances of being affected, uh, multiple of them being affected at the same time due to the same hazard or a force of nature, like, um, like a flood or a power loss, should be low. So this, this idea, essentially the idea is that when a zone is down, uh, the rest of the region continues to operate smoothly. All right, so with that in mind, with an understanding of redundancy and failure domains, let's apply it to the Kubernetes control plane. Uh, this diagram may be a bit oversimplified, but uh, it shows a typical highly available architecture where all the key uh, control plane components like HCD, API server, and the core Kubernetes controllers, they run on a set of uh, three instances that are spread across three different AZs. And um, e even the load balancer that actually takes north-south API traffic from clients is replicated across the AZs. Similarly, uh, the in-cluster uh, API traffic that comes from clients via the Kubernetes uh, service IP that is also backed by API server endpoints from multiple zones. Um, now let's go back to the earlier discussion around single points of failures. Um, so with redundancy, we might think we are at a better place, um, especially uh, given these, these sort of components have a failover 
um, mechanism inbuilt into them. Like, uh, for instance, etcd, it's a quorum and leader-based system, right? Uh, if you're familiar with it, it needs two out of three replicas to be running at any given time to be operational. So you can lose one replica. Um, and among the other two replicas that are still available, which form the quorum, you need to have one of them as the leader, uh, an active leader at all times. Um, similarly, controllers in Kubernetes uh, work based on a lease-based leadership concept, uh, where if one replica is unhealthy, ideally the other, uh, th that one should fail health checks, and uh, another replica should just take over. Similarly, with API server, uh, let's say a single API server is unhealthy, the, uh, the load balancer, sh it should stop receiving traffic from the load balancer, uh, typically because of the uh, ready Z, live Z health checks that are configured on the load balancer. So sounds simple, right? It feels like we kind of have what we want with terms of, uh, in terms of redundancy and high availability. So if AZ1 completely goes down, say uh, we have all these mechanisms that should allow us to smoothly fail over to um, AZ2 and AZ3. Except zonal failures are not always hard failures. Uh, where everything in that zone just comes down to a grinding halt with a failure rate of 100%. That's just not uh, the reality all the time. Sure, there are failures like fiber cuts and like, I don't know, hurricanes and complete power loss that leave a zone completely unreachable, but zonal failures can actually virtually take unlimited forms in terms of size and shape. And most of the ones we've actually seen uh, operating Kubernetes clusters are gray failures. Um, so like power or thermal issues that affect individual rooms uh, uh, in a zone or networking problems between zones that uh, cause some sort of elevated latencies or spiky uh, throughput behavior and so on. Um, also, zonal failures aren't always just caused due to lower level physical stuff, but it can also be due to, uh, if you're familiar with zonal infrastructure services like block storage or L4, L7 load balancers, these are services that are designed zonally and the services that actually operate uh, th these components, they sometimes also deploy software in a zonal fashion, uh, just to reduce the blast radius of bad, bad uh, software bugs in a region. Uh, which means that if a service that you depend on has uh, done a bad deployment in the zone, that could cause an outage um, or some sort of impact for you. Um, so yeah, I think the, uh, the bottom line here really is zones may completely fail, they may totally become unreachable, or partially uh, in terms of slow requests, occasional timeouts, um, et cetera, and basically everywhere in between. Um, and to be able to respond to such events as cluster operators, we believe at Amazon EKS, and more generally within AWS, that we need to be prepared with um, deterministic mechanisms to respond to such non-deterministic events. Um, which means despite the nuances of a specific failure mode um, or a potentially limited understanding of the failure modes amidst the event while there's already a burning fire, uh, we still want to be able to guarantee a very clear positive outcome, which uh, in, in the case of the Kubernetes control plane means the API has continued availability it's, uh, and there are no, uh, by continued availability, it's not just uptime or healthy. It's things like you don't see uh, API errors, you don't see high latencies and stuff. Uh, that and also for all the various controller workflows, uh, they should be able to operate without um, any increase in their downtime. So essentially, we want to be prepared uh, for these sort of non-deterministic failures with a strategy where we can, without even sometimes fully understanding the event, safely weigh away from a bad zone uh, into a healthy zones. Uh, with that, I'll pass on the mic to uh, Jyoti to talk about the fun part around the case studies we've seen. Thank you, Sham. Hi, everyone. Uh, I'll walk us through uh, some interesting use cases and case studies that we have seen while operating this. Uh, we learned that zonal failures are not deterministic, and failure modes depend heavily on the nature of correlated failures. When correlated failures happen in a single zone, Kubernetes components fail very differently based on their retry strategy, circuit breaking, 
health checking, and general failure, any other failure handling technique. Uh, the failure modes that we'll talk about today are for API server, etcd, controller manager, cloud controller manager, and these are just different components. API server is stateless, etcd has quorum, the controller managers work um, based on leadership, where even if there are more than one replica, one is doing the work really, and that makes the system very complex. Uh, the components itself do not have a notion of zone built into them. It is up to the, the platform administrators who is putting the components to work to understand the nuances of uh, zones, zonal failures, and how it may impact the components. Uh, these depend on the administrator to be able to pull a card to say, so I know something is happening in a particular zone, can we not use this and remove the chance of correlated failures? Let's look at the picture and see what's happening here. So in this diagram, there are three zones, and in this diagram, zone one is partition. This partition is caused by a slow volume attached to the etcd node. Again, here, the network is not fully gone. The instance or the host are not fully go gone, just that the volumes attached to the host are responding slowly. When that happens, the general latency of the system reduces, sorry, increases. And any calls or requests to that particular HCD node in zone one has a high latency. Now, HCD has peer health checks. Other HCD nodes are health checking on this HCD node in zone one to say, hey, how are you? And it is just taking a long time to respond because of the latency. Eventually, the latency may increase so much that the health checks fail. When the health checks fail, this HD node in zone one loses quorum. It thinks it is the only node in the system. Now, coming back to the API server part, we use client-side load balancing on API servers. Now, the API servers know about all the three HCD hosts when they started, and uh, when a request comes, from, comes for a particular resource to the API server, it creates one connection per resource called a watch. Uh, this connections are load balanced, and these are load balanced across the zones. So an API server here, in this case zone two, which is healthy really, has a connection to an etcd host in zone one. This means that a problem in zone one is already leaking out into zone two. It causes non-determinism in the system. In this case, the etcd is not terminating the watches that it already has any new traffic to that HD node will not go through because reads, writes, and watches, they need quorum while creating the connection. But once the connection is created, it does not terminate them when the leadership loss happens. In this situation, because the connection never terminated, API server cache got stale. It never got an update, even though other HD nodes are progressing. In this case, again, we had a leader uh, in Cube Controller Manager also in zone two, because uh, K KCM is watching an API server to give it a node or whatever resource it is looking for, it's not getting it. In the meantime, let's say node controller, node controller has a problem, it stops working. And any other new nodes joining the cluster at this time, it's just not joining a cluster or doing taints and tolerations, nothing is working. Um, so what do we do with it? We uh, but let's talk about why did this happen. This happened due to a correlated failure. In our system, we have reconcilers that look at health of the HD nodes and terminate them when it thinks that this node is not healthy. Let's terminate that and let a new instance comes up uh, and reconcile itself. But this reconciler itself also was having a zonal failure. Uh, this correlation caused the reconciler not to be able to terminate the host in zone one, the HD host. So the fix was simple in our case. Uh, because we uh, handled the intra, we made sure that the reconciler also terminated the HD process first, followed by the host termination. Now, even if the host termination does not go through fine because of its retrying or it's just taking a lot of time, because the HD process is gone, the connections are severed, and any new uh, connections are going to the healthy zones. Uh, what could we do next? Uh, we could go to the etcd uh, node and make changes where the server 
always terminates connections when the leadership is lost. We are also thinking that we could do more client-side stuff with gRPC um, discovery service. gRPC has this concept of Envoy discovery service. We could use that to say if a certain host is experiencing higher latency or higher error rates, don't use that for load balancing. Uh, we, we could use gRPC health checks to influence the traffic routing so that API server does not use the HCD uh, in zone one in that case. So a lot of uh, issue links are, the, are here. We are working on them. So we'll probably arrive at something. Let's look at scenario two. In this picture again, zone one is partitioned, but it's not fully partitioned, just that the API server is experiencing higher than expected latency. The users now are not having a consistent experience. Sometimes their requests take, uh, are quick, but sometimes they take long. And in this case, uh, this particular API server in zone one, uh, any traffic coming to it through the load balancer or through the cluster IP is experiencing a very um, heavy latency. Now, to make this uh, experience consistent for users, we employ a mechanism called way away. We deal with the load balance in a particular way and the cluster IP in a different way. For load balancer, we use a uh, concept called application recovery controller. It's a public API. And for all clusters in a, uh, in a region, we go and tell the load balancer that, hey, don't advertise this particular IP in zone one. Due to that, any new connections coming to the load balancer does not use zone one anymore until we ask it again back to. The cluster IP is tricky because uh, Kubernetes handles uh, this part. The API server has an advertise address and an endpoint reconciler. The endpoint reconciler takes the advertise address and makes uh, endpoint objects of Kubernetes. And they don't fail health checks even if API server is unhealthy. They are like DNS. Kube proxy uses the cluster IP to round robin load balance between the API servers based on these IPs. We made a change such that uh, if we tell through the fleet that in zone is experiencing a uh, problem, then the API server is now zonally aware, we made it so, and with that, the endpoint reconciler stops advertising the IP in zone one. With that, any parts or any part of the system which is depending on cluster IP or endpoints, they directly go to the other API servers, they don't go to zone one anymore. Now, an important nuance to that is the concept of over-provisioning. Let's say we take one API server out, that means we are reducing the APF quotas of the system by proportion, by a certain proportion, right? And mo most times, this just works out uh, because we over provision the API server more than what it would need. So we look at metrics, throttling metrics, and we have certain uh, laddering. So uh, with certain requests, we set certain quotas. But when this kind of zonal failures happen, most probably customers, other customers are also seeing that, which means worker nodes are shifting traffic, ports are moving away and evicting. So it pounds the API server with way many requests at this time. So we have also have a system where we track the throttling uh, parameters or metrics in the API server. And if we see that the throttling is occurring way more, we go and scale it out. Uh, we create more replicas of API server to withstand the problem so that users don't experience a problem. Let's look at the third one. In this case, we have a reconciler that does a health check throughout the fleet. And the health check is if X number of health checks fail in Y amount of time, terminate an instance. Maybe something is wrong with the instance and let the system reconcile back. In this case, when zonal failures happen, let's say the health checker is fine, the API server is also just doing fine, but the network stack in between is just behaving abnormal, then the health checks will fail. We observed that in such cases, a large number of clusters just lose one API server because the health checker terminated them. It's not bad, uh, sorry, it's not good for, especially for large clusters because API servers has a ton of uh, watch cache and KMS encrypted uh, decryption done. And 
it's just not good to, for a brief interruption to kill all of that and start a new API server again. Most possibly, during these correlated failures, we don't want to try and put a load, lot of load on dependencies, HCD in this case, or KMS services, or other dependent APIs, because they may fail and eventually back off. When, it, when they back off, uh, recovery takes even longer. So in this case, what we do is we uh, circuit break our health checker so that when it sees that certain threshold of uh, health checks are failing, it slows down. And if it is even more, it just stops and pages us. Um, an interesting aspect is that we track a lot of zonal metrics. And this health checker is health checking all the API servers and pushing a lot of metrics to our backend systems. We consume those metrics and create um, like we feed it into a system that can detect and tell us that one zone is really having a certain problem in, uh, and we use API server health Z per zone, uh, requests failing per zone, throttling, all these parameters and feed into system, and then the system tells us and pages us saying, I think something is going on, you should go check. And it automatically starts the the weight shift process. The weight shift is such a safe process that we can just deal with that and then um, an on-call can go check, release, release it, or keep it going. The next one is incorrect control leadership. In this example, again, zone one is partitioned, but it's partitioned in a way that just the DNS resolution is failing in zone one. Uh, when that happens, most Kubernetes components don't fail, except anything that depends on remote APIs or internet. In this case, Cloud Controller Manager. Uh, because the Cloud Controller Manager is able to still get the lease from API server, because API server and HD are just working fine, it continues to maintain leadership. It is not failing health checks. Many components today, uh, upstream and our own components, they, they can't detect such nuanced DNS failure, API uh, failure from remote APIs, and feed into health check. And as a platform owner, there are like 10 different components we are running. It's really very hard across very many code bases to deterministically find out how to fail these um, health checks. So we implemented something where we added zonal awareness to the controllers. And when we understand from the previous slides, I mentioned that we can detect zonal failures. When we understand that something is happening zonally, we go again, um, push an API, which instructs all of these controllers to relinquish lease deterministically. Even if a controller is not facing a problem, we make it very deterministic and say, all controllers, please move out of the zone. And with that, no cluster will see any downtime at all. Uh, because this is so undeterministic because DNS is cached in most cases. So even if DNS is out, it's okay. This controller will keep working unless some controller restarts, some host restarts, and now DNS is not available anymore. It's so undeterministic. Let's look at how it looks like. So in this picture, we uh, the colors show the leadership distribution across zones. And we uh, this is from one of our test simulations where we let the system um, fail, and the, uh, our zonal shift kicks in, and the leadership moves away. So the blue line goes up because it is now taking all the leadership, and the, the other lines, I think the orange, uh, goes down, and uh, it is relinquishing all the uh, leadership. We do it in a very safe way, such that if there is no replica available really to take leadership, don't take it. Don't do this. Um, this. this is the last one. So the next one is uh, HCD durability. During HCD up upgrades, uh, we do a rolling update. We have three HCD nodes at steady state, and we kill one node, let it come back and join the cluster. Kill the second, let it happen repeatedly. Now, if a correlated zonal uh, failure happens at this time, and a host has been terminated and yet to come back up, the system is vulnerable. Uh, it is available, it can still serve in quorum, but if any other, other node has a problem, it loses quorum immediately, and that's a risk. Uh, most uh, implementations uh, out there take a backup of the HCD periodically, 
and then apply them when quorum is lost. Although uh, it has an availability risk where from the time when the quorum is lost until the time the, uh, the restore happens, the system has an availability loss, no reads or writes can happen, but the most riskiest part of it is the uh, durability loss. When we restore, we are going back in time. Anything that has happened from that time, say 15 minutes, five minutes, whatever the periodic interval is, we lost the data. So we improve the durability posture of the system by doing a static volume approach. So we have static membership and static volume. All the HTTP data is on the disk and those disks are never thrown away. And these disks are spread out across the zones. And whenever, if for any chance the uh, two hosts go down at the same time, they just come back up and start right there. There's no chance of any data loss. Uh, what is the chance that this may happen? So in the, our workflows, the most critical part is, now a new host came up, uh, we detach the volume from the old one and attach to the new one and assign it the membership it needed. There's a, a slim chance that something may go wrong at that time. So what we do is we remove the chance of correlated failures again by saying, we won't let HTTP updates go through when we know that a zonal problem is happening. With that, uh, we have decoupled of infrastructure, infrastructure such that if we issue an API server update, it will, uh, it will go through without updating etcd. We can put that in a queue, and when we know that the system has recovered, we can go look at that queue and recover it. HTTP is an implementation detail. Anything that bad happening in HTTP should not leak out uh, to the customers, and we try to ensure that. These are uh, Slack threads, uh, Slack handles in uh, Kubernetes channel. Please reach out if you have suggestion, feedback, or anything that you want to brainstorm. Plenty of links. Uh, all of them are well spread out across the slides. They're all gathered here. I will be publishing this uh, as a PDF doc in the SCED. Um, so please uh, go through, read them, and uh, we work working with upstream to, to suggest things that we see and uh, make the system better. <laughs>